welcome everybody. So this is going to be a short <coughs> for, uh, overview of how we built our application from, let's say, a startup planning. Well, might, some of you might think, I'm not going to cover any business things. I'm not going to cover any <coughs> dark things. I'm just even going to try to uh, run through some of the numbers, not to bother you. But one thing I would need from all of you is a little bit of interaction. Because this talk, when I started preparing it, it would take around five hours. So I had to really cut it down. And it's always depending on the audience what I'm going to focus more on or less. So I'm going to skip some things if I see you already know that or you're not interested in it. Things like that. So just a short about me. My name is Mira Svetka. I'm working as a PHP developer for the last 15 years. This year I have moved to another startup from the Nyushka that I'm talking about. But I was a Nyushka guy for the last five years. Start, uh, starting as a developer, being an architect, also developing team leader, and in final uh, technical analyst. So what is Nyushka Hi. Since most of you don't know it, I'm just going to be brief. It's an online classified platform, so if you want to sell your apartment or your car or your mobile, you go there, register, put some pictures and say, OK, I'm going to sell for some money. And somebody else, if they're looking for a car, apartment or something, are going to browse, maybe contact by email, by telephone, something like that. So it was founded in 2007, something, something. And it was built as a startup inside a corporation, which is something that is really unfamiliar, at least in Croatia. And I'm hearing in a lot of other countries. So I'm going to try to focus a bit on how that has been a bit, a bit of a difference. So how is the Nushko team organized? We have three separate companies. Nushko is Nushko team is doing the core business. Like what are we going to sell? How are we going to do it? Things like that. While we have DevOps or system admins, everything else in a separate team, and developers in another team. So with this organization, as we are all uh, located in Zagreb, what we have accomplished is that a lot of start startups have their developers oh, <laughs> So a lot of companies have their marketing team in one room while their developers are in another. <coughs> Anybody like that? Or anything like that? Nobody? One, two. Very lucky crowd, I must say. Because, well, if you have ever been in a, any kind of company, people tend to come to developers like, you know, just enter the office and like, can you do this? Please, can you do this? It's really, you <laughs> have to do it. But then, of course, they leave somebody else comes. You're not that banner. Can you do it? Yet? <laughs> and things like that. So, with this, the developers were on another location. So uh, when you had some requirements, you had to prepare. Your uh, team had to prepare. And on the other hand, if we had a really important meeting, we can call each other at the <coughs> end and say, hey, let's do a coffee, let's do a meeting, let's do a lunch today or maybe tomorrow in the morning. Because it's like 20, hour, uh, 20 minutes drive your car. So we still have face to face while not having the problems of, hey, I need something. So one of the things that we had as a major issue is scale. So one of the, I'm going to cover just from the 2009 to 2014 since this is the time I came to the project. And I'm showing you these numbers because a lot of, a lot of companies are saying we have a million visitors or something like that. They use that as a technical benchmark on how good or how fast or how something is their system. And in five years, while our visitors grew only two and a half times, our page views grew like 12 times. And that happened because we got more and more content. People decided to sell more and more. 
browse more and more. I start getting used to, okay, I can find something and buy something there. <coughs> Actually, uh, I don't have the numbers here. Okay, I'm gonna, so on the technical side, our disk usage went from like under 30 gigabytes to around 10 terabytes of data. Uh, big benefit from something that you might be running at home on a better ADSL, something to over 450 megabytes, <coughs> megabits per second. Database, a one gigabyte, 360 gigabytes. So, don't care, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the, these slides were done also for creation, for creation of audience, so it's a bit different who cares what. So when we're talking about platform as what software we're using, it's built on a LAMP stack with Nginx as a proxy in front of Apache. We're using Swings to search and Memcache plus Redis to cache the things in. So the code, it was built using an in-house framework because, well, in 2009, I don't know how many of you remember those years, uh, Kohana was the best thing ever. Then six months later, KPHP came, then Code Igniter came like six months ago later. Okay, maybe I've switched a bit. But it was changing a lot. We needed something that we, are, we know that we're gonna be stuck with for next long time, long time. In my, in my own opinion, in 2014, don't do it. Like, really don't do it. There are really great open source projects, and all in house frameworks are just losing the battle. How many of you are using an open source framework? Raise your hands. So, and the other ones? I'm, can I presume something homemade in house? Yeah. Well, some of the issues that we found through the years is that you will never be able to invest so much time, but money time, into developing that framework forward <coughs> as much as the whole of open source community will. So if you even have 100 developers in your company, will all 100 work on that framework for months or they won't get paid? Well, in the community, Everybody gives a little bit and it builds a really great thing also. Uh, you are able to learn best practices. In your company, how many of you are using TDD? Yeah. So you can learn better practices by using some of the open source frameworks. Uh, dependency injection. Anybody using it in a homegrown? In a homegrown? Nice. Uh, also, it's really much, much easier to introduce new developers. Because, well, when you put an ad, we need a PHP developer, and you're working on Send or Symfony or E or Laravel or whatever, you might actually find somebody that's familiar with that framework. So it's much easier to incorporate them in your dev team. Also, issues like, why doesn't this bundle work? Why does that bundle work? Your in-house framework, it's not going to be Google. So, on the physical location, uh, we chose to use a local data center with our own, so uh, our local data center. Why? Because 90% of traffic is Croatians looking to buy or sell things. So you don't want to have your servers in the US if 90% of people are here. Just introducing network latency that you really don't need or want. And possibly some legal issues. But with that, with that in mind, uh, we had to do our own bare metal servers. I mean, when I'm saying my, our own, we had to buy things. And there are some pros and cons. Uh, anybody using their own servers here? Cloud? Uh, you can raise them, but 
bit more. <laughs> and what is everybody else using? <laughs> I'm just wondering, just to see. <laughs> because like some of the hands is not hundred right? percent. Probably not even close to it. So. The rest didn't understand the question. What? The rest didn't understand the question. Oh you didn't understand. So <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, uh, who is using uh, parametric servers? So you go to HP, Dell, IBM, or somebody, and you say, "Give me one machine." Thank you. Oh, others are using probably cloud, like Amazon, DigitalOcean, or something else. And there are really uh, big pros and cons <coughs> for one against the other, and it's if you even remove the price, I'm not going into. Price, but the, more, the biggest pro of having your own servers means that you have dedicated resources and you have constant performance. On any cloud, uh, you can raise 10 instances now and none of them will have the same <coughs> performance. Also, none of them will have the same performance in five hours, but in five days, in a month. Who knows? It's really hard to see, okay, my application got slow. Why? For instance, on one of my site projects, I was using DigitalOcean and decided to check how 5.5 uh, is, is it quicker than 5.3 and how much for my application. It was 50% slow. I was calling them like, what the hell is happening? Well, you, get, you got on a slow machine. Sorry. The third one was 30% faster than the first one. And I was like, okay, is, that, is it then faster or not? Tell me, I, I, I need concrete numbers. I'm not going to push new version of PHP for now. But on the con side, there's no, no quick scale. So let's say you're a small startup and you're building a new product. Uh, new product. Uh, you're going to grow if you're successful, of course. And it's really hard to scale because if you need to buy a new server, you have to do the whole buying them. If you're built, if you're buying a, big, uh, a bigger server, they're actually building them on demand. You know, somewhere in China, Taiwan, or some, somewhere like that. So it takes a month to be in your data center. On Amazon or wherever, you can get them in minutes. So you need 15 new servers. Think, 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 think. Uh, it's hard to isolate services. So, for instance, when we were adding things to our architecture, we decided to put it on a database server because it has to index some data from MySQL and to. It seemed like a logical choice. Two years later, when we removed it from that server, we found out that Sphinx was taking twice as many resources than the MySQL on that server. We didn't see it. So once we have actually moved it, now we know how much something costs us in resources, in speed, in CPU, and everything else. So when you're having your own servers, you're living on the edge. And I'll, there are two modes. Let's say you have your C database CPU at 80%, almost in every week. And you have to build a new feature now that's really database intensive. How are you going to build it? You have like a really small space to grow. And you have to measure, OK, can we do this? Then you have to go to your client or product manager or somebody and say, oh, look, we can't do it. But we, if we get a new server, yeah, we can do it. Then, OK, they order a server, but we don't need it. So you have changed specs. And you have to uh, concentrate on performance instead of the feature. And I know the developers don't like to be uh, spoken about things like features and costs and benefits and everything like that. But you have to put yourself also in the client's shoes because well, you are actually earning some money from the success of that feature and everything else because well, if the company dies, you're looking 
for a new job, new client, somebody like that. So you have to measure, develop, then optimize, then test, deploy, and everything else. And it's really frustrating, but it, at least it was really frustrating for us. And on the other hand, remember that database server I told you that we just bought? Well, it came a month later. Of course, it was like five times stronger than the one we had. Because, well, we are not going to order a new one every month. So we had to compensate for the like maybe next year or something. And that CPU usage went from like 80% I think it was 16%. <coughs> I'm actually giving you a real live example of what happened to us. It went down to 16%, and nobody cared anymore about performance. So we were building a new feature, and our CPU went to 25%. Still white. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Then came a bit more of traffic, and we were at 40%. Then we built another feature, and in less than a year, we were back to 80%. Because what? We forgot to measure an optimize. Because it's small, it doesn't look like a problem, you know, you have a place to grow. Well, you actually don't, sometimes. So it's going from one extreme to another extreme. And that's not really good. So try to, try to, when you find yourself, try to actually test the oversize of things, but don't forget to measure an optimize. <coughs> so, how many of you are working on an application that has more than two servers? Okay, can you actually raise your hands a bit more because I'm seeing you. Okay, <coughs> so we're using a pretty generic generic part where our visitors had two uh, front servers in front of them and some number of application servers behind a master uh, MySQL server and the Sphinx search now. So I'm going to just run through what each of them says, uh, work, uh, does. So those two front servers, they are uh, running their mm -hmm. DNS round robot. So 50% of people go to server one, 50% go to server two. So if one of them fails, DMS can easily switch to number one. We have no problems. We're running Nginx. It's actually working as a load balancer to switch all the requests <coughs> to our application. But it's also using, uh, also doing the SSL folder. For instance, don't use SSL on, on Apache, at least on 2.2. Don't. Really, like, don't. Uh, it, it helps the caching of assets and images. When I'm saying assets, I'm talking about JavaScript uh, style sheets and everything else. And it's also blazingly fast for accepting non-binary content. We actually had uh, hardware in our servers to zip content that we're pushing out. It, we found out that Nginx in software mode is, is taking less resources that hardware part on the motherboard. <laughs> yeah. uh, so application service, we have six boxes. So they do the application. They serve the original images and assets that will be then cached in front of them. And they host the memcache cluster. For instance, we're using it for sessions. So when people so people can be logged in on every server and not only number one. And for Redis slaves, our main DB server now hosts MySQL master and Redis master. After we move the Sphinx uh, off from that box, and we are again not sure how much resources Redis now take. And actually, when we're talking about isolation, we have problems with Redis that would kill a bad sheet on the application servers. We had a small bug that was show, uh, uh, sending too much data to our slaves. And then the memory manager would decide, well, we're going to kill something. <laughs> what would we kill? Oh, a patch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there are some, if you can't isolate everything, really. 
it's just, it's just, and yeah, and those servers have, I think, 32 gigabytes of room around. So it's not like we're running on something that has a gigabyte. Oh, we're done. So, okay, on the third server, we are running the Sphinx. If you have any questions about Sphinx, you can go to them later. So, with a slave, we're using it for Sphinx indexing, and the most important thing is for backup. So, in the past, we had problems where we would have to back up our database at 3 in the morning. And we had actually a maintenance window where we would be not working from 3 to 5 in the morning. Because it took two hours to back up all of the data. <coughs> now that we have a slave, we can run back up whenever we want. Then we still have that. And in 2009, when I came to the project, it, all of this was running on just one slave. Okay, we also have two staging servers. Uh, we're trying to mirror the production architecture so we can test new. Uh, new features on something that looks ex almost exactly like production. So we have six application boxes, two front servers, arrays running with a slave, memcache, and everything else. But it's a smaller scale, we don't put the real time traffic on it. And it's supposed to be used for final testing, but you <laughs> why? Uh, Next slide. So we also have a test server. This, this was a gr really great thing for us. So on one separate server, we are running 10 different Neoshkal applications just on another subdomain. So on each of these subdomains, there's only like one new feature that we're building. So let's say on test one is the copy of production. And we are doing some feature. That's located on test two. Another feature, test five, test seven, test ten. We were actually, at some point in time, we were trying to give them names. The name of the feature we were building. But it took like half an hour to build each time, so we just went from one to ten and go through. So, uh, So it helps us to cherry pick what is ready for production because on each branch there's only one small feature, maybe buckets or something, and it enables us the multi-feature development. How many of you are actually developing multiple features at the same time for your project? <laughs> yeah. So I don't have to get into details about that that's fine. So how many of you are using something like this where clients can see only that feature? Um, oh, here comes the Git. Who's using Git? Who's using Subversion? You can't use both. Oh, you're using it. Actually, you're using both. <laughs> so, in 2010, when we started having a really, real issue with subversion, branching doesn't exist, <laughs> and don't try to tell me that it does exist, my CTO still didn't prove it four years later. Exist or before? Well, same crap, so. <laughs> I'll destroy the camera. And the idea is that Let's say we are now started working on feature number one. And we are done, but somebody decided that feature number two is more <coughs> important. We start working on that feature two. Then we ship it, deploy it to production. We start working on feature three. And then feature number one comes back. So what we are really focusing on is each of those branches must, must be replaced with production branch. So on each of those branches is production code plus only that feature. It helps us with deployment because in that, in that case we don't have any merge conflicts to resolve before deploying. And have you ever had any 
merch concert before deployment. <laughs> Subversion, please change. No, like really. Uh, so we have like two different maintenance and two different development points. So there's a maintenance that's like, oh, some text is broken or it doesn't work in I7 or some smaller bug fixes or some smaller features like, can you move the price from here to here or title breaks? Differently. So we're in maintenance mode, we're just using Kanban or pre for all. We go into issue tracker, look at what has the highest priority and start working on that. But it has really low defined specs. And we, are, we were really trying to keep it like that. <coughs> Sometimes product managers like to say, we would need a new registration form and put it as a small feature. And then when you start asking about what fields should be there, well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, what, how is it going to work? Well, just wait. <laughs> now, new features go to development. And the point is to have high defined specs. Because what we are using, well, have been using for years, is waterfall model. So we do the specification. We say it's going to cost that much. Go OK. You have to say, oh, is it OK or not to build. And then we actually have specification as something to prove to client, yeah, yeah but if you want five new features in, first we can't do it for the same thing. And it's going to cost more. But that's something that us as developers were not having problems with. That's a bureaucracy that's doing both work. And let's try, let's try. But try to keep your uh, new features as highly defined as you can. Because it's really a lot of frustration for all of the developers when they when client doesn't say everything, or product manager or whoever, and then and then some things that might have been uh, normal to them are not normal to us. As developers, because no, I didn't predict that there are going to be six banners in that page. <laughs> so, yeah. So, let's get back into the start of versus enterprise things. So, this is one of the, I think it's Facebook's quote yeah, to move fast and break things. How many of you have ever heard of it? Uh, I was at Facebook. And the whole idea is, don't look back, just build shit, ship shit. Who cares? It's a new feature, it's going to bring us millions or something, but if we break something behind, well, we're going to fix it at some point. Who of you is working in a startup or something that has a similar vibe? Oh my god, how people started raising hands. Well, let's say that this is enterprise. How many of you would like to travel on a spaceship built with that? <laughs> oh shit. Oh. I see beer was popular a few minutes ago. You've been drinking already. So one of the things is, how, how do you become an enterprise? Or let's say, let's consider it. Everybody has a different point of view what is an enterprise and what is a startup. But let's keep it to what I think. It's just a transformation of goals and mindsets. So it's not something you put in a roadmap like, yeah, we're going to build a cool new uh, web shop for e-commerce. You're going to have a million users next year, $10 million, and you're going to be an enterprise. No. Uh, at least I've never heard of something like that in any kind of road. When? So, you become an enterprise when those mistakes start costing you more than 
what's a better or longer preparation, more testing, or just buying some additional hardware to have around and just not even using it, but if something dies, you have a server on hash. And when I'm saying costs, I'm not saying money. It's not only money. Uh, it can be your pride, because you don't want to be that developer that's constantly producing new bugs. Well, really, no. You don't want your brand or client's brand recognition to go down because, well, you want to lose money. And the journey from, let's say, a startup to enterprise, well, we started with like, almost zero scaling experience. Uh, most of the team members that came in had like zero experience because all of us were working on smaller web applications that were in best using one server, even, even if that much. So we had to learn the time, how to do things, <coughs> and there's no manual, trust me, at least I didn't Google it. And you have to listen and read what and how others did. But don't keep to just PHP community. Uh, listen to other communities, because uh, they can teach you also really great things, like Twitter. It's Ruby plus Scala or something like that. So you might not find a solution, but you might find an idea of how they solved some problem that might help you. Broaden your horizons. How many of you have seen this meme? How many of you are working in the company number one? Or let's not invest in our people. <laughs> How many of you are working in the company that's willing to invest in you? We are there. Yeah, but it's Saturday. <laughs> uh, you might joke, but I'll, I don't have enough time to relate, uh, go into more details on that. But, uh, that's one of the things why I'm doing this talk. Because I've actually learned a lot from others, and I just wanted to share some of my experiences. To some of you, it might sound like, ah, oh, Captain Office. But yeah, 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 I know that, who cares? Uh, I work on a small site or something. But it might give you an idea or two about how we solved some of the things. So I really want to give back to the community what I have gotten from. And I'm hoping that you'll do the same at some point, tomorrow or maybe in two years. So what are some of the most common performance pitfalls? 95% uh, of any performance issues are database related. You really cannot fuck up your PHP Really. <laughs> and whenever you're doing any kind of performance, please don't look at yes. for loop is faster than for each. <laughs> please. <laughs> like, I've actually had developers talking to me about for is uh, better than for each, and then using the group budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not kidding. So if your user can hit any of those queries, don't. Like, no, never, never. Because this is like practically uncacheable in the MySQL file. And this, from the temp temporary tables to file uh, sorts and everything else, and it's like the worst thing can happen. But even I have done some of this at some point. Because, well, you're in a hurry and you do it and you don't think and somebody puts it on the home page and everything goes down. You saw very well to find all of this. Because in MySQL you can put uh, on a slow query a limit of like a second, so everything that runs above a second will be in that log. How many of you are you have 
heard of MySQL slow query flow. How many of you are using it? <coughs> Some hands are like. <laughs> uh, there's some low hanging fruits when we are talking about uh, performance. Uh, implement any kind of cache, uh, cache, like most of the web applications are greedy of intensive. You're probably going, going to write something in the database once, twice, and then read it like the next. Hundred thousand or million times. Uh, let's say you have caching of something. How many people have read this article? Cache for fifteen minutes. Do you really care? Is it hundred or hundred and fifty or hundred and fifty thousand? Who cares about that number? I mean, if you do care, implement some cache master. So whenever you you can kill that cache. Or do some something else. Try to cache as much as you can. Uh, implement versioning and long inspired numbers <laughs> on all the static content. Uh, we had real issues with one of our front servers, and we were unable to remove it out of the production and say our application server is going to serve everything. Because on every page request, you have additional 10, maybe 50 other requests for CSS, JavaScript, for that image, for that small image, for that bigger image, for some content. So 100,000 requests, you actually have 5 million and something requests. Your network stack <coughs> might not always be able to, uh, to uh, do that much traffic. And we actually couldn't remove that front server out because of the pure <coughs> And the front end server is like the small uh, the smallest part that has a lot of memory. So it's caching all of that on into memory and just serving it out. You want that jQuery? You want that jQuery? Yeah. On the long expire headers. On the every page your user goes to, they don't have to get the jQuery again. And again. And again, and again, which can be 500 kilobytes of additional data for every page request. How many of you are actually implementing any kind of versioning and long expires or static on? Uh, separate the database server. It's really easy. If you need performance, just move database. MySQL, Postgres, or whatever you're using from that, your one application server to another. It's just changing a config where you say different type of address. It all works. Uh, oh, running out of time. Uh, I'll have to run through some of this and get to some of the tips and tricks oh, for this. Oh, I'm not going to skip this. So. Uh, in 2009, me personally, I have to take blame for this. I was irritated with all the requires and includes on top of my every PHP file. Do you remember like an include like that? Yeah. So I decided to implement out the older as every library we are using. Even each developer didn't have the same pool installed. So you know, remember that's before PSR0. Right? Let's put that class there. We were using every imaginable idea. So we actually had to parse all the PHP files to say that class is located on that file. And okay, we were starting using file library, but more quick see. And after five to four years, we found the critical bug. It was a logical flaw in that part of the code that actually produced production crashes. And one might talking about this is it was really hard to find the bug. It was more than a week for three developers to locate the bug. So when can you be sure your hundred lines of code are bug free? 
and this one was 50. If it worked like the first 10,000 times, 100,000 times, million, billion, eight billion times. That part of code was running for four years on every request without a problem. So nobody was looking there. Because, well, from 2009, if it worked for four years, what's the problem now? Well, yeah. <coughs> so, some of the tips and tricks. How many of you are using Windows? Oh. <laughs> uh, we actually switched all of our developers to Linux. To be used. Why? Uh, it's easier to develop. Okay, now you have Vagrant, which can help you a lot. Then we didn't. But we were hitting so many problems, like I wanted to put Memcache. I'm a Linux user for seven, eight years. I wanted to put Memcache in production, and I was told, well, it doesn't work on Windows. How can I set it up? How can I do this? How can I do that? So we had a lot of problems of introducing new tech to the production because people were limited with their development process. And you don't want people developing somewhere then copying it to some other server and everything else. So we switched to Linux. And one of the things that, for, I'm just going to say an example uh, where a new colleague was coming into our team. A young guy just finished his college, and his and we were uh, we were always asking what uh, what operating system do you want to use? You can use Windows, you can use Linux, whatever. And he decided to use, go with Linux, and we told him, okay, in that case, every problem you have with Windows, you have to solve yourself. We cannot help you. We're all in Linux, but if you're ready to try Linux. We can help you with that. He's actually now preaching Linux and saying that all PHP developers should be used. Because it's much easier. I know everybody's scared of, well, it looks different, I can play games. <laughs> I mean, do you really play games on, uh, in your office hours? <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask him for you to raise your hands, but the most important, the really most important, is how many of your you Windows users have found a problem in production and were like, well, I remember myself, I really remember myself, and I remember a colleague he had some, there was a deployment issue. So while deployment, uh, deployment failed in half, and his Windows user, he moves things like this. <laughs> it's a remote server, you have to use it. I mean, I'm not blaming him. He doesn't use terminal every day. So he's really afraid of it. And he was running around the office like a kettle's chicken. I mean, I'm, I understand that because it was me five years prior to that. And try it. You can always be it. Get familiar with your terminal. It's really not that hard. Face to face discussions. How many of you have ever had a discussion with a client face to face? So a lot of you have something like a product manager or project manager between you and the client. I am actually not fond of that because uh, often that person doesn't understand tech. It's really great if that person is, is coming from a tech background. But usually project managers come with the idea of new registration. <laughs> and what? And we actually don't use any project managers as project managers. We're trying to use the 
developers as let's say vertical. So for instance, we have a new feature coming in from Yoshkova. One of the senior developers is going to be a project manager, also a team lead with more people in it. And that really helps communicating with, between everything and everybody. Uh, if it's really a front-end thing, then it's not going to be one of the PHP guys. It's going to be a front-end developer. So if we are doing you know, like a new design on the home page, um, I'm not going to run that project, sorry. That's a front end guy. He can do it. We trust him. If he needs anything, he's going to ask us to do it, help him, and that's it. So we try to have as many meetings as we can outside of the office. Why? Because if you do a meeting with anybody, it doesn't have to be a client. You always have a person like going around and oh, can you do just this small thing? Then, okay, then somebody goes, does something, comes back, then somebody else comes and interrupts it. Uh, if you're in a bar or a restaurant across the street, they're not seeing you. They can't interrupt you. You can always silence your mobile if you really need to. Uh, it's more like that. Atmosphere. Why? Because you're stuck in your office for eight hours a day, five days a week. It's like 160 hours in a month. So when you get out of the office for like two hours a week, maybe an hour a week, you're more relaxed, more willing to uh, engage, talk to somebody, even if it's that product manager or your team lead or something like that. Because there's not so much uh, officiality in it. So actually, if you haven't tried it, try it. It really uh, worked great for us. And I know a lot of teams that were really uh, jealous of that. Uh, analyze seasonality. So what's a seasonality? <coughs> when you're peaks and you're low times, you can predict your user behavior using seasonality. seasonality. Because, for instance, we found some patterns based on hours in the day. So we have peaks in the morning, <coughs> on a work day in the morning, in the afternoon. But still the biggest peak is in the evening. When people uh, have done their dinner and want to see what's happening on the internet, day of the week, uh, Sunday and Monday are top days for us. Saturday is like, <coughs> there's no way. Uh, months in a year, our traffic starts going up somewhere in September, and peaks in uh, January and February, and then goes down towards July, in August. And one thing we found very annoying was weather. Like, you're almost at the peak time of what you can do, and it's Sunday evening coming, and it's raining. And you have 50% more traffic. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> weather, I've spoke with a lot of people that have found that correlation with it's nice weather outside, there's nobody online, it's shitty weather outside, everybody's online. So how many of you know any kind of your seasonality? So how do you deploy if you don't know when it's your low time or your peak time? <laughs> yeah, this wasn't rehearsed. <laughs> so we decided not to deploy after 4 p.m. because you don't want to deploy something at 5 p.m., be in your car five minutes later, and then going back to the office when the shit hits the bed. So, after the 4 p.m., no, really like, if it's a really critical, critical bug, yeah. like, let's put the banner on here. Try to avoid Fridays. Uh, actually, the developers, after listening to me about this avoid Fridays, have been <coughs> Like 
writing a bit. My own developers, new school developers, because they're the first ones that are not keeping to that schedule. They're the first ones. So the client, Yushko, knows not to deploy on Friday. But they tell them, well, let's do it just this one time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, just this one. And then there's a bug. There's another deployment and things like that. And so try to upgrade during night. And at least for us, that's a low time. If you're running a porn site, it's probably <laughs> don't be quite good enough. Attitude. Uh, I'm the first one having an attitude problem at some point, and all of us will have. So try to put, try to make lemonade when they give you lemons. It's really important. And I'm being told. So, questions? <laughs> <laughs>